Greetings, Yash Joe 30 here, and today I've got this uh, kit. It cost me about well, close to 50 bucks. It's what they call the Mini D Class D amplifier kit. Um, it's made by, well, designed by Silicon Chip. It's a 10 watt per channel stereo amplifier, or it can be a 30 watt mono bridged. Um, and it runs on a DC voltage between 4 to 13.5 volt. Uh, it, it uh, uses SMD parts as well, but all of them are already pre-soldered on the board, so you don't have to do any SMD work. There's the JCAR catalogue number there, it's KC5530, if anyone's interested. So let's open the package here and we'll just have a look at um, the destructions that come with it. Uh, so here's the schematic here, it's uh, not really all that overly complicated. Um, most of you that know what Class D is all about, basically we'll ignore this input circuitry here. It's basically a pulse width modulator which generates a square wave, um, plus minus, and uh, two gate drivers which then go into two MOSFET output stages or switching transistors. And those transistors switch with the square wave on or off to allow the output signal to modulate on the speakers. Um, and they're using a TPA3113D2 um, Class D audio amplifier I see. The, the outputs are bridge tied load on either channel. They've got these two link wires here you can put in for mono operation so you're actually bridging the two amplifiers together. So you just simply short output uh, PR to output NR, the same with output LR to output N, uh, output, the same as output PL, you short it to output NL, and then that just brings the two outputs as bridge to load to a single speaker. If you do that, I wouldn't go any lower impedance than 8 ohm. Um, but that's the schematic. What's interesting here is I've got two shock key diodes, they're double shock key diodes in the same uh, package and two Zener diodes here across the common and across the hot wire of the inputs and that's just pro providing uh, a form of um, input protection to the uh, IC but I just found that um, interesting. Up here they also have a fault LED which lights up when there's a fault condition. Because if you follow this line here, it comes off a pin marked fault on the IC. So if there's a fault internally with the um, IC, probably with the, uh, the output shorted or whatever, it would light this light emitting diode, which will be out when um, it's uh, working normally, obviously. And there's another LED over here for power. So, let's have a look at the Skirkit board. Okay, so this is the Skirkit board. It's double-sided. And all the SMD components, including the TPA 3113D3 chip, which is there, is mounted. And they do say that you do not need a heatsink. Well, even Class D does need a heatsink, as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, yeah, there's not many components to put on. There's a few headers, uh, a couple of potentiometers, some input connectors for the audio in, left and right, plus the uh, volume pot, and some capacitors. Um, because that's all you get. So I think this is a really well-made, compact circuit board. Um, however, there's a lot of people out there that will say and tell you that Class D sounds absolute crap. Uh, mainly because they reckon you can actually hear the switching of the output stage. I seriously doubt it. Although, there are cases where some of the earlier Class D amplifiers did sound like absolute crap compared to their Class AB counterpart. However, I don't know too much about Class D amplifiers, I've never actually heard one in action. So, I know how they work, but I have never actually physically uh, serviced one, built one, 
tested one or listened to one so this is a first for me so I'm going to just uh, well start building what I need to do in component wise um, which is not very much and uh, yeah go from there okay so I'm going to open up the bag of parts here and get a start on things not very many of them as I already previously stated. They've given us some headers there and I said some jumpers and an analog 10k pot at least they got that right. So question is what to start with first well I would start with these uh, header pins because they're the lowest profile. Now I was looking at these two potentiometers here VR3 and VR2 but um, they're not actually populated. They do say put link wires across. So you see there's a line there and a line there. So you're just joining the two. Now if you don't join these two connections together. All right, now I might do, I guess I'll do the terminal connections. Now these actually interlock to each other. So there's a groove in one side and there's a tongue on the other and they just go together well they're supposed to go together <sighs> like that and then just place them in the holes and there's one over here which is the power supply Just a quick note here, this large amount of copper here is also acting as a heat sink for that uh, TPA 3113. That's why it doesn't require a heat sink because the copper is acting like a heat sink. So I can now just trim off the excess wire here. I mean the average constructor, if you don't have to do the SMD stuff, you could get this done in probably about 20 minutes but because this is a copper heat sink it's making soldering the legs of these negatives of these um, 100 microfarad capacitors awfully difficult uh, all right now we have two input connectors left and right And that completes the construction. All the parts are on the board and it's now ready for testing. Not quite yet. There is actually another couple of link wires you've got to put in. 
uh, LK6 and LK or CON6 and uh, uh, that's what the rest of these are for so there's five left over you cut off uh, in between here for two and three and they go there and there so I'll just put them in and uh, now we're, then we're ready for testing we really need to begin testing on this so as usual I'm going to do my standard trick of extending these out uh, so that I can connect some fly leads to it um, these orange connectors are a lot better than the blue ones in my opinion uh, the green ones are exceptionally good too now before I get started I've got the uh, DDS open I'm going to replace this uh, I think it's a 470 microfarad capacitor here which is the mains filter capacitor with this uh, 2200 instead just to A reduce the ripple being um, regulated by this or trying to be uh, filtered by this regulator and it probably would give me a much cleaner uh, output on the um, DDS. Correction, it's only a hundred microfarad. Yeah, that's that's way too small for a filter cap. Um, so I'm going to change that to the 2200. It's at 25 volt and I'm using the 18 volt tap on the transformer which would give me... Uh, so we've got 18 volt AC multiplied by 1.4 RMS 25.2 Hmm, yeah, that might be a little bit underrated. Let's see what I can do about that. Okay, so I decided to move the uh, active wire from the 18 volt tap to the 15 volt tap. That gives me around, we go 15 volt AC multiplied by 1.4 RMS, about 21 volt DC, which is well in within the spec for the capacitor. Um, and the regulator needs to have 1.2 volt higher on the input than what you want to regulate on the output or 2 volt or whatever it is so I think I've got plenty there I've had to readjust the output voltage because it was down to 14 volt when I moved the tap there so I've just re-put it back up to 15 volt it's disconnected from the DDS module and there's the capacitor there I've bent him over because it interferes with the heat sink but that should work perfectly fine as it is um, I'll just connect it back up to the DDS module and make sure everything works. Yep, DDS is functioning. As we can see, we have a uh, display now. So, I just want to see what the actual output sine wave looks like now. Well, it looks a little bit cleaner. Uh, I reckon the regulator IC would be a lot happier now. Um, I did notice that when it was driving a speaker directly, the DDS that is, it sounded awful. That sounds a little bit better. Shouldn't really drive a speaker directly. Just put this back onto sweep mode. Mm, yeah, that sounds a bit more cleaner than it was before. Okay, I've got everything hooked up to the left channel, just a crappy audio lead here, uh, across a dummy load into the oscilloscope. Uh, so now all I've got to do is turn the load on. Whoa, that's pretty noisy. And I haven't even done anything yet. Well, wow. That has got to be the most disgusting waveform. Just look how noisy that is. And that volume pot doesn't really do much adjustment. I'm running at 500 millivolt peak to peak input and I'm getting a V peak of 23.91, sorry peak to peak. Looking at uh, 23.9 divided by 0 0.9 equals 11.95 squared. equals that divided by the load hmm it says roughly 17.8 watt but yeah that output waveform is horrible 
absolutely horrible. Okay, I'm going to look at the uh, frequency response of this amplifier. Just drop the voltage per division down a bit. I'm going to go into sweep mode. That's between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz and the actual VMAX voltage output is not changing much so it is a relatively flat response uh, between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz which is average Ah for f sake Now because I had a little bit of an accident, I shorted that green wire to the one next to it and now the fault LED has come on. Now in a fault condition, if that LED comes on, it will stay in fault protection until you turn the power off and back on again. And now our normal output resumes. So I'm now just going to swap the outputs. to the right hand channel and see that one works apparently it does still noisy as hell and it's also pushing around a voltage peak to peak of 23 volts so so what did I say that was in wattage that's uh, 20 we'll say 23 divided by 2 11.5 times itself squared. That's that divided by the load. 16 watt. Okay, so we know that the output waveform is disgusting because don't forget this is class D, so there's going to be some switching noise on the output. That's why it looks all haggard as it does and hairy. That's because there's a lot of switching noise on the output. You probably won't notice it on a pair of speakers. But that's going to be my next test is to hook this uh, amplifier up to a set of speakers and figure a way of getting audio into it. Because um, I don't have, I might have some RCA leads somewhere actually. But I need to get it off of the computer. Okay, got it hooked up to some bookshelf speakers. And I'm going to do what is known in the service industry, the technical term, the blurt test. So turn the load on. Couldn't hear any noise at the output. It's going to touch. Yep. Yep, we got output. So let's uh, hook it up to a source of music. I might just use my laptop.
I have a little lizard friend. I think they call them skinks. He's just hanging out. Come to say hello. Hello. I'll try not to disturb him too much. They're getting in through a little gap in between the wall and the floor near the doorway. Um, anyway, this little amplifier module, yes, it does work. It sounds reasonably okay. I can't hear any uh, switching artifacts in the output. I am quite impressed with the uh, overall performance of it. The short circuit protection, I found out, does work. Uh, so, yeah, it's perfect for driving two little bookshelf speakers, which, which is what it was doing. Um, it has, well, not much bottom end to it, but then again, that could be the choice of speakers I've got here. I was running that at 13.0 volt there, and this uh, this IC is not even getting warm. And when I was running it at full power into the dummy load, it was slightly warm. So you don't really need a heatsink, no. And currently at idle, we're drawing 40 ma. So all in all, it's uh, quite a nice little amplifier module. So yeah, anyway, what am I going to use it for? Well. No idea. I'll find a use for it eventually. Right now, absolutely nothing. I just bought it for a little bit of an experiment and some fun. I'm the Astro 30 and as always if you like this video please remember to rate, comment and subscribe below and you can always follow me on Facebook and Twitter, the links are in the description as usual. Anyways this is the Astro 30 saying see ya, have a great day and I'm not your Darlington.